Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The congregation at the synagogue in Nazareth was a tough crowd. In our gospel, we hear Jesus' first sermon in his home congregation, which is recorded in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the synoptic gospels for how closely they track with one another. The three accounts are largely the same. Jesus preaches and people don't believe him, and he says that famous line, no prophet is without honor except in his hometown. And Matthew and Mark end the story there. Because of their disbelief, Jesus could do do no deeds of power, and so he moved on. But Luke's version continues, and it's always very interesting to see where and how these three gospels diverge. Luke adds to the story as he continues with Jesus preaching, saying, There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian." When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and attempted to throw him off the cliff. Jesus references these two important stories from the Hebrew Scriptures, the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings and Naaman the Syrian in 2 Kings. Both stories recall times when God's judgment was upon Israel, And while at the time of drought, struggle, and suffering for God's chosen people, God sends these prophets to outsiders, to foreigners. First, God sends the prophet Elijah to the widow of Zarephath in modern-day Lebanon during a great drought. When he finds her, she only has a handful of meal and a little oil left, and she's gathering sticks to cook it for her son as their last meal before they die. But Elijah promises that the meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the rain falls again. And it didn't, and they survived. Naaman the Syrian, from Syria obviously, was a commander of a foreign army afflicted with leprosy. And he comes to the prophet Elisha, Elijah's protege, for healing. And Elisha tells him to wash in the Jordan River seven times and then come back. And he did, and he was healed. And so, in Luke's version, what really incites the wrath of Jesus' hometown, and they're wanting to literally kill Jesus and throw him off a cliff, was these two stories about God giving aid to outsiders, enemies, strangers. They did not celebrate that this woman and her child who were dying of hunger survived because God fed them, or that This man who was afflicted with leprosy, which was like the worst thing that you could have in the Bible, was healed by God. Rather, they were offended and quickly shifted from amazement at Jesus' gracious words to anger and rage. One Bible commentary, the 1995 New Interpreter's Bible, which is not so new anymore, describes this passage as declaring the inclusiveness of God's mercy. And it describes the dynamics of this story in this way. It says, The people of Jesus' hometown read the Scriptures as promises of God's exclusive covenant with them, a covenant that involved the promises of deliverance from their oppressors. Jesus came announcing deliverance, but it was not a national deliverance, but God's promise of liberation for all the poor and oppressed, regardless of nationality, gender, or race. When the radical inclusiveness of Jesus' announcement became clear to those gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth, their commitment to their own community boundaries took precedence over their joy that God had sent a prophet among them. In the end, because they were not open to the prospect of others sharing in the bounty of God's deliverance, they themselves were unable to receive it. It goes on, God's grace is never subject to the limitations and boundaries of any nation, church, group, or race. Human beings may be instruments of God's grace for others, but we are never free to set limits on who may receive that grace. 
Through history, the gospel has always been more radically inclusive than any group, denomination, or church. So we continually struggle for a breath of love and acceptance that more nearly approximates the breath of God's love. Not bad for 1995. I think what we see in Nazareth is a very human reaction to what Jesus is saying. It is so easy to, domest- to domesticate God's promises and make them our own and forget the ways in which God's love, grace, and mercy transcend and transgress the limits and boundaries which we knowingly or unknowingly place around it. It is easy to fall into a scarcity mindset where more for them means less for us. And it's everywhere in the scriptures. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, when the prophets call for compassion and providence for the orphan, the widow, the stranger, and foreigner. And throughout the life of Jesus, where he uses people like the Good Samaritan as an exemplar of faith and travels through enemy territory to teach and to heal. Today we celebrate Reconciling in Christ Sunday, and this is a new thing for us. It's our first time. The Reconciling in Christ process has been around since 1983, almost 40 years, to help congregations welcome, love, and celebrate members of the LGBTQIA community. Nearly a thousand Lutheran congregations are reconciling in Christ, including local ones like Trinity Lansdale, St. John Bluebell, Living Word Roslyn, Christ Ascension in Chestnut Hill, and St. Mark's Conshohocken, along with our own synod and seminary. And around 360 churches are in the process. The goal is to be more welcoming, accepting, and understanding to our LGBTQIA siblings, and in the process, become even more of the welcoming church that we are. Why is this needed? Well, as you know, there is a history of exclusion in the larger church that has been harmful to many. Over history, the church, like the congregation in Nazareth, has drawn boundaries that have been harmful to the, to the LGBTQIA community and other communities. We know that, and we may not have participated in it, but after so much exclusion and stigmatization and harm done in the name of God, which we know still happens today, it really requires an affirmative statement of welcome, a special invitation. To me, this is important but less compelling than the fact that we have members of our own church, youth and adults, who need for us to understand, to listen to their experiences, to fully welcome them, and to embrace them. Our youth and young adults in particular are watching us to see if we will really accept them and their friends, looking to see if this is a safe place, if people will love and react to them in positive and affirming ways, if they, as one person shared with me, are not just tolerated, not just accepted, but embraced, and to use the language of this epiphany season, that they are beloved. We have family members and friends whom we want to better know and love and offer a spiritual home, people who have been led to doubt their own belovedness, and we can help to rectify that because, as our reading from Corinthians says, it is fundamentally about love. And why now? Despite all of the buzz in the news and media, it really has little to do with that. True, There has been a reckoning taking place at all levels in our culture, in business, education, nonprofits, and churches, in recognition that we need to do a better job of honoring diversity, practicing inclusion, and widening our welcome. But for me, it is about the urgency of loving and welcoming those we know and those we have yet to meet, those who are still on the margins, hiding, bullied, rejected, and often suffering alone. People's lives are literally on the line, and we can do something about it. The Trevor Project's National Survey on LGBTQ Youth and Mental Health for 2021 reports that 75% of LGBTQ youth reported that they had experienced discrimination based on their sexual orientation or gender identity at least once in their lifetime. 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, 
including more than half of transgender and non-binary youth. And only one in three LGBTQ youth found their home to be an LGBTQ affirming place. The Trevor Project also reports that LGBTQ youth who report at least having one accepting adult in their life were 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year. Think of the difference that one person can make, that any one of us or all of us could make. When I think about why now, I've actually been thinking about this in a different way. I've actually been wondering why UDLC hasn't done this sooner, because we place such a high value on welcoming and relationships. That's what we are all about. I've heard so many stories so many times about the ways in which you were welcomed, loved, and supported in this church that I could probably recite them back to you. Welcoming is in our DNA, but it is a journey. Being welcoming is something we commit to and practice, something that we continually grow into. You know, when Pastor Al Douglas came, he invited UDLC to be welcoming in new ways, with a contemporary service and a band, and creating a service that would be welcoming to people who were seeking and new to church. In that time, you opened a nursery school to welcome the families of our community. You adopted sharing time and services and woes and wows and meetings to share your lives, to know, understand, love, and welcome one another and deepen those relationships. Pastor Diane invited us to think about what welcoming looks like across cultures, whether it was in Global Mission in Tanzania or in serving in the Appalachian Service Project. Welcoming is not our birthright. It is something we work at, something into which we grow. So I don't want you to hear me saying, I never want you to hear me saying that you've done something wrong or that some kind of judgment is being passed. What I want you to hear is that I believe in what this church is about so much and that I believe in what you are about so much that I know that we can do this and that we can reach people in our midst, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities that need the love and welcome that we ourselves have received. And that's why I've asked you to join in this journey, because I believe, as it says in Isaiah 58, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairers of the breach. And what do we need for this journey? Lots of love, lots of listening, lots of conversation, and then more listening and more love. For everyone shares the deep desire to be known and to be loved, to be known and to be loved both together. For to be known but not loved is to be what? Rejected. To be loved and not known is empty. Love is always something that is done in the particular. When you experienced welcome here, you were welcomed in the particular. I've heard the stories. You were welcomed and embraced as you cared for a sick kid, as you wrestled with your kid's intellectual disabilities, as you were widowed and feeling unmoored from your life, when you were grieving a loss, when you hadn't stepped in a church since you were a kid, when you had launched your family into the world and were looking to deepen your faith in your empty nest. You welcomed a young pastor with four young kids that you never fail to ask me about even now, and in recent years, seminarians, figuring out who they are in ministry. You comfort the grieving at the cemetery and joyfully teach our youngest neighbors at the nursery school. We know how to do these things because we learned how to do these things, and we practice them over time. And this is another opportunity for us to grow and for us to share our love with people who may have never heard that love from a faith community before, to compassionately connect with the people in our own lives for the sake of relationship, for the sake of the gospel, so that we may share, as it says in that commentary, a breath of love and acceptance that more nearly approximates the breath of God's own love. I know this is a little longer than I normally preach, so I thank you for staying with me. And I just want to share one last thing. My mind this week has been casting back 
to my beloved late preaching professor, Peter Gomes, who you've heard me mention many times over the years. Um, professor Gomes was the minister in the Memorial Church at Harvard. He was my preaching professor, my advisor, and a giant of preaching and faith. He was a short, black, round man, most of the time wearing a dark, wide, pinstripe three-piece suit with a pocket watch chain hanging out. He loved all things English and spoke with a Boston Brahmin accent, and he prayed at the second, second inauguration of Ronald Reagan and the inauguration of George H.W. Bush. When people were confused about how all this could fit in one short, round package, he was often fond of quoting Ralph Waldo Emerson, that consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Peter was appointed the minister of the Memorial Church in 1974, the year I was born. And in 1991, there was a conflict that arose at Harvard where the distribution of a student-run publication led to a spate of harassment and slurs against gays and lesbians on campus. A gathering was held where most of them usually are on the steps of the Memorial Church. And Professor Gomes, as the religious leader of the college, was asked to speak. And in solidarity with those who had been targeted, my beloved Professor Gomes came out, calling himself a Christian who happens as well to be gay, risking his position, his security, his authority, and subsequent calls for his resignation. And from that point on, he dedicated himself to address the religious causes of homophobia, which he was doing when I met him in 1996, having just published his bestseller, The Good Book, Reading the Bible with the Mind and Heart. I'm sure some of you have it on your shelves. And I've been thinking, there is no me without Peter. There is no me without Peter. Or the other LGBTQIA plus pastors, professors, and ministry leaders in my life. In fact, they have been the most influential people in my professional life and in many ways, my personal life as well. I wouldn't be the pastor I am, the pastor that you know me to be, without them. And I think that if someone somewhere in the church, some person of goodwill and faith, had not welcomed them, had not accepted them, had not loved them through the times of rejection and hate, had not encouraged them and given them voice and authority to preach and to teach, my life and my ministry would be so much the poorer robbed of the grace, mercy, and wisdom that they have invested in me. And the church would be so much poorer as well. We have an opportunity to do a very good thing, to make an important difference in people's lives, in the life of the church, in the life of the world with this reconciling in Christ journey. As the band sings, we are a people on a journey of discovery, learning together what it means to follow Jesus, eager to see and walk the path that lies before us, practicing mercy, longing for justice, embracing the whole world, lit by the fire of love. May it be so. Amen.